you like the little uh do you like the little subtle intro film i love the <laughs> subtle intro film yeah i went for i went for quiet reserved you know not too much in your face <laughs> All right. nail on the head Nail Absolutely. in the head. Nail yeah. in the head. Absolutely. Um, welcome, everyone, and welcome to Cruxcast number 68. I can't, can't quite believe it. The amazing people we've had on this little show, uh, it's been just wonderful. And today is no exception. We are joined by the brilliant Stephen Harris. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm very well, and thank you. Thank you for the invite. This is uh, this is excellent. I've watched previous shows, and uh, they've, been, they've been superb. Hopefully, I can add some value. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, we've had, we've had some amazing guests. Um, in fact, I'm going to touch in on some things that previous guests have said, which are kind of relevant to what we're going to talk about today. There's a okay. there's a big L word, which we're going to talk about throughout this, yep. that sort of threaded through this, and we're going to get up to the sort of uh, the important point here. And that L word is, is leadership, right? Which is a big thing that you are heavily invested in, heavily fascinated with. And we're going to talk about some exciting stuff in, in and around that kind of leadership thing. Um, and and there's some quotes that I've taken from people on previous uh, Crux casts. I can't believe I've done 68. That's quite incredible. Um, and I'm going to bring them through today. So for, for those that, that don't know you, there's, there's, uh, there's clearly... <coughs> For those that do know you, they'll know that you've, for the last, uh, I don't know, five plus years, you've been in senior roles in health, safety, environment, security, and risk. You've been doing all that wonderful stuff. Um, but, and we'll get to that. We'll get to how you got there. And we've got we've got kind of similarities in some aspects of our careers. We've been sort of yeah. walking back to back, not knowing each other, doing quite similar things in quite similar areas. Um, but, but for now, Stephen Harris, where did it all start? Where did it all start? Let's go right back in a time machine to the start of your uh, your life. Where where did you grow up? So I grew up in Dundee. I grew up in a small village just to the east of Dundee called Brothy Ferry. Um, I was really lucky with my background. Um, I came from I don't want to do mom and dad a disservice or my sister, but you could describe it as almost an average family. You know, we had we had a very average house and and uh, mom and dad were great. Dad was a sales professional, so uh, he was a silver tongued devil and could wax lyrical about most things. Um, what, was, what, was his, what was his industry? Um, he was in tobacco. Um, <laughs> and before that, he was away at sea. He used to work for Canard, so... Yeah, sail the seven seas. So I like to think of myself as a very well traveled person by by pretty much any measure. I was I got a new passport actually, a, a new fancy new one. And I was nice. looking at the old one that I I threw away. I've actually, funnily enough, I've got the pages of it here. And I'm going from Azerbaijan to Ethiopia to Angola to Libya to Nigeria to Brazil to the States to Ghana to Kenya to I mean it, you know but um when I sit down with dad he embarrasses me he yeah, he has he's been literally proper. Uh, yeah um and the stories that he told as well were just incredible arriving at these islands where the islanders you know, we used to swim out and come out in canoes and, and throw up carvings and the people from the ships used to throw down soap and, you know, and different incredible. perfumes and things like that. And uh, he he lived an incredible life, which is, I think, largely where my perspective on life came from. Um, my mom was a teacher, um, right. an English teacher. Uh, she was great, uh, still is great, sorry. And uh, yeah, my sister was five years older than me and and we had that love-hate relationship that you have <laughs> with a sibling. Um, I, I, I never, and I, I, I still love her to this day. But I can't say I always like her, but I always love her. Well, absolutely, absolutely. There's something quite. I mean, Bro Brotty Ferry is a lovely place, isn't it? It's a lovely, a lovely place. It's great. It's uh, yeah. built on the back of fishing. Um, built on the back of Dundee being the. The, the premium place for jute jam and journalism back in the yeah. day, the highest population of millionaires per square kilometre in the whole of the UK and had a beautiful microclimate because of the hills that surrounded it. So it was actually the sunniest place in Scotland as well. Um, but then, unfortunately, the city fell in hard times. 
and it went from having the largest concentration of millionaires per square kilometer to Scotland's most deprived city. And um, we've done an awful lot of work in the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, some of the commercial leaders, just amazing. Some of the council leaders, just amazing. And we're now named by magazines like GQ and National Geographic as being the coolest place in the UK, the coolest city in the UK. It's quite, it's quite, uh, you know, um, I've grown up um, knowing Dundee, uh, knowing that Here, here's the thing, here's the thing, I'll just share it with you, full disclosure, um, I've yet to be proven wrong with this. And some people might this think this is a bit sy sycophantic, but I've never met someone from Dundee that I didn't like. Eric, I've heard that an awful lot. Uh, I love Dundonians. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I love Dundonians. I'm just going to quickly say hi to uh, Andrew, who's uh, joined us. Great to have you with us, Andrew. And Brett Townsley, the one and only, he was Cruxcast 67, uh, is joining us from Disneyland Paris. We've got international guests. Okay. That's just great. Yes. That's brilliant. So, so yeah, um, yeah, I love, I love all of that area. And you know, we went down. Sarah and I went down. I, I would say probably when we were allowed to in between lockdowns, we were getting permitted permitted to travel and stuff like that. We went down and did the V&A and we stayed in the hotel down in the harbour there, down in, just across from the V&A and we went out and had dinner in a fantastic restaurant, went to some really cool bars. There was a kind of speakeasy recommended by a friend of mine from Brotty Ferry, who I also thinks one of his parents is a teacher. Do you know Zach Fleming? I don't. You I don't? don't there don't we go. I need to yeah, introduce you. Brotty Ferry up. Boys, right. Brotty Ferry yeah. Boys. Uh, and yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful place. So, what was what was um, what was what was life like as a an early young man, school and all that? Was what was what was wow. your thoughts around that? It was it was excellent. My my parents gave me an awful lot of freedom. Um, so I was very much the the kid that left the house as soon as it got up in the morning, and I was always uh, I was always a morning person. So. Um, I can't remember a part of my life that I didn't get up and jump out of bed at six o'clock. I know that'll make some people sick, but <laughs> it's just the way I was. And, you know, at, at those early morning days, that was when all the really great shows were on as well. So you got up at six and things like Trans World Sport was on. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could learn about all these incredible things from Kabaddi over in <laughs> India. And, you know, absolutely everything. And I've, I've always been a keen sports enthusiast. Um, so yeah, I'd leave the house and then I'd come back when the uh, when the street lights turned off, and that was that was pretty much it. So we were uh, an awful lot of football, an awful lot of rugby. Um, when I got into my teenage years, I took up golf. I was fortunate enough from that area; it's big golfing country. Yeah. So it got to the stage um, because I absolutely adored golf, um, and the local professional at my club. Um, I was his little Padawan and it got to the stage of him saying, okay, so you, you've got golf and you've got rugby and your social life and things like that. You're really going to have to pick one of those avenues. Um, yeah. And it was at that point that I realized that golf had stopped being a passion and had started to become a technical discipline for me. Um, so I pulled back from golf and I jumped into rugby um, had the most amazing group of friends growing up. Um, still speak to them every single day, actually, on the WhatsApp chat these days. Um, and, and yeah, they're spread around the UK from, we've got Matthew and Alan down in London and Tim and Colchester, a lot of the guys in, uh, in Edinburgh, Alistair over in Northern Ireland and, and some abroad as well. So, yeah. Outstanding. I think there's something quite, quite sweet and special about, um, keeping in touch with childhood friends, like properly keeping in touch, not just seeing them once every couple of years or whatever, but properly keeping in touch. That's, that's awesome. I love that. I think, I, I think it really grounds you. I think that, um, I, I don't, so for example, a couple of the lads are, are exceptionally senior at what they do and very, very good. If you take Tim, for example, down in Colchester, he's a, he's a really highly regarded surgeon. So not many people challenge Tim. He's, you know, he, he walks into his hospital and, and he owns every room he's in. Yeah. Until, of course, he comes back and sees us in Dundee yeah. at Christmas time or during the summertime, in which case he's just Tim. So he gets challenged on absolutely everything. everything. And we bring up all the embarrassing stories and, and, and Tim comes back to earth. Proper friendship. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think that's important. I think it's very important. Hi to Adam, to William, uh, who joined us from Norway. Beth, lovely Beth Alexander, and Brody Smith, bigging up, uh, get an ice cream in Brody Ferry, Brody Ferry when he was younger. I love that, love that. Brody's a star, good to see him. So, uh, so in your mind, you know, we're all thinking about with our education system. You're sort of forced to think about opportunities as you're going through secondary school and stuff like that. What were you yeah. thinking might be a career path for you? What was the interest back then? What did, was there something that you really wanted to be? Um, well, no, to be honest, I was I was always a, a very keen member of the Young Enterprise and um, the Young Enterprise scheme at school. And, you know, I took economics and management studies and I was always kind of going down that route. Um, my career advisor was absolutely convinced I was going to join the forces. There was there was from our first meeting. I couldn't even speak to him anymore about it. He just. As soon as I came in to sit down, he got the brochures out from the local army and RAF and Navy office. So and this is for you, son. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of what you might want to do, here's where you're going. I want to be an uh, economist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that that was fantastic because I did have a huge passion for the forces as well. And I've got a, a couple of people in the family who... Uh, who I, I've looked up to since the year dot, and they were they have very successful careers in the forces. So I thought that that may be a way forward to the to the degree that I actually went down to Aldershot. Uh, the parachute regiment paid for me to come down and have a look around and spend a couple of days with them. Um, but my heart was set on going to university and studying of all things economics. So uh, I I. I, I was fortunate enough to get an unconditional offer to Edinburgh University and uh, went off to study economics. And my professor was a chap called Professor Simon Cook, who's passed away now, but he was an intensely intelligent and an intensely interesting man and hid a huge emotional intelligence behind a very demure and monosyllabic voice perfect example of which um on the first lecture that i i went to i'm not saying the first lecture i'm saying the first lecture i went to right two different things yes um gotcha. I, walk, I walked into the lecture and uh, and simon coke uh, who i think took about the second or third lecture said um there's going to be a stark reality for some of the people sitting down in this lecture theater some of you are going to realize that you have a passion for the subject and that you were correct to study economics and others are going to realize that you just had a really good teacher at school that made the subject come alive i'm not going to make the subject come alive and uh, within about the first lecture i realized that i did have a passion for economics but i also had an awesome teacher at school so right. the next couple of years were, were were difficult but we got there we got there so we got there. That's interesting. I didn't know that about you. Um, so what did, what did, how many years was the course? Three. Three years. What did three years studying economics? You walk out after three years, you have learning throughout the three years, probably after year one, you're like, right, okay, I'm getting this year two, I'm getting into it heavy year three. What did economics give you? Economics is um, an absolutely fascinating subject. So not only does it teach you and subsequently motivate and inspire you to make data-driven decisions. But um, on a macro and a micro level, it's all about individual, organizational and um, whole economy psychology. It's the, the, the most incredible subject if you wanted to put together anomalies and KPIs in order to predict future trends, then economics is the way forward. Um, there was a fantastic quote given by uh, Dame Hackett, uh, the ex-head of the HSE, that said that we don't invent new ways to hurt people. Very much in the field of economics, there's not much new out there. Mm -hmm. So it's just about recognizing the cyclic nature of your economy or your activity or your organization, putting the pieces together, but obviously being very careful that you're not falling into that human trap of heuristics and that there's a gap in your data. So you just fill it with something and sometimes don't even realize you're doing that. 
um and then uh and then coming through to the end so uh uh, there's Chris Rich here, an old friend. Well, of he's mine. just made a comment that I need to put up on the screen. Yeah. I, need to do, I need to do that. Uh, Steve is like a pencil with a bigger head, only physically. He leaves a mark wherever he goes and a positive one at that. What a guy. What a lovely thing to say. Hi to Carolyn as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Chris. But yeah, that's what economics gave me. Economics gave me a, a fantastic grounding on uh, on decision frameworks. And I, I'm constantly speaking to clients and I'm constantly speaking to colleagues and peers about making smart decisions and how to make smart decisions and and compartmentalizing projects and things that you're doing into those key critical decisions and understanding them and understanding their implication and their escal ex escalation factor into into perhaps areas where you don't want to go but and you've got me started Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I love the fact, yeah, we never planned any of this. None of this but, is scripted. Yeah, you know, the, the thing with risk, which we're starting to get into now, is that um, risk to the general population is usually something with an inherently negative outcome. Mm -hmm. But risk can also be swapped out for opportunity. Yeah. So it's another great way of stacking cards in your favor so that that event that you're working your probability, your likelihood, your consequence, and your severity on doesn't necessarily have to negatively impact you. You can put yourself in the frame for a positive outcome, but that positive outcome isn't usually put down to bad luck or aren't, aren't we unfortunate the way that negative ones are. The, the positive outcomes usually put down to a manager saying, well, I knew that had happened, so let's <laughs> not talk about risk. It was all down to my competence. Yes, of course it was. <laughs> now, 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 don't scoff at this, right? But I, uh, you know, you know what? You're a reader, right? You're a comprehensive reader, right? Um, uh, as was I. I say was I because I used to read a lot, and now I watch more and listen to more audiobooks yeah. and stuff like that. But I used to love having a book. I always had a couple of books. Um, so I, uh, I, I read an article about how this this guy was saying basically your entire life is economics, everything about your life. Some people will say your entire life is mathematics, it's economics. And I was like, hmm. And he recommended I go and buy Freakonomics, the book. So mm. from a layman's perspective, I know you're a degree qualified economist, right? So, but I went and got Freakonomics. And you know, sometimes you come across a piece of literature, a piece of uh, a book or whatever, and, and people are raving about it and you read it and go, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, Freakonomics was one of those blinding light, <laughs> blinding light moments for me where I actually, as I was reading it, I felt I felt like like pain in my head where other sections of my brain that were dormant were opening up and yeah. getting tuned into this. And then I read Super Freakonomics, which went a bit deeper. Um, actually, on that subject, because it's such a fascinating... I, I don't know if you can call economics a subject. I don't know what you can call it. It's fundamental, right? Is there a good book you can recommend for maybe that's just beyond Freakonomics in terms of uh, educating us? I think... Uh... Niall Ferguson wrote a fantastic one that talked about the evolution of money. And I can't remember what it was actually called, but Niall Ferguson, I think it was actually the evolution of money. And it talks about from the very beginning in terms of trading and, you know, almost marginal utility theory where you all only really do what's good for you and things like that. And it, it brings it on and brings it on and brings it on. And I thought that was, that was a game changer for me. I remember, I remember getting to the end of it, and it was almost like getting to the end of the Rugby World Cup when the final <laughs> final game's been played, and you kind of sit there and think, oh, crumbs, what am I going to do now? That was so amazing. Yeah. I got that distinct feeling with Niall Ferguson's book. So, yeah. That's a good I would, one to check out. I'd recommend that, yeah. Um, anything, anything at all to do with uh, Adam Smith as well. But the... He was the father of so much of, of of our modern understanding. But what you have to be very careful with the with the authors in that in that area is where the asset of money. Thank you very much, William. Brilliant, Rob. William. Uh, nice one. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, what you have to be really careful about with um, authors on that subject is that uh, there's sometimes very dry, very academic based writings. Whereas the beauty, and it was beauty of Freakonomics and Super Freakonomics, was that um, 
narrative sitting on an armchair next to each other here's how it pragmatically works in the real world uh, uh and that was beautiful the likes of broken window theory that they broken window about. yeah i mean that that's the blinding light moment the broken window theory isn't yeah. it brilliant brilliant uh, i was i was in a i was in a i was in a bar with a very good friend of mine he's uh he's an ex regulator and um i don't want to go go into too much of what he does now because I don't know how we stand on naming names, but um, we were sitting together just last week and talking about risk, and uh, and we both kind of looked at each other and, and and remembered the time when the penny dropped. And once you get it, you get it. Yep. And until that point, you're always swimming around outside it. So I guess a, a huge part of what I do is not only you know, if you want me to come down and do hazards, hazards, rewrite management systems, you know, use Bayesian probability theory to tell you when things are going to go boom or whatever, that's fine. But a huge part of what I do is coaching and mentoring and trying to download what's in my mind and the rationale behind it on the paper so that I walk out of the room, the client gets it. And next time they call me, it's not to come back and do that depth of work. It's more to come back and say, can you just verify I'm on the right lines here, Steve? Because you know, what you did last time was a great piece of work. And now I know how to do it myself because they get it. And and when everyone gets it, that's utopia. Happy Absolutely. days. Happy yeah. days. Right. Big question. How does someone, if you're listening to this and you haven't met Steve, you might be sitting, well, clearly he's a professor. Clearly he's a high <laughs> oh, academic. How does yeah. that guy with the, with the kind of level that you're talking about right now and what you are into end up working on a jack-up? <laughs> So <laughs> it's a great, 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 great question. So when I was at university, um, I wanted to earn some money. So I, I had a look around at what people did. And you had people that worked behind bars. You had people that worked in sandwich shops. You had all kinds of things. And my father, I was very, very fortunate with that not only um, was he a great guy, but he'd also taken me to my fair share of uh, boxing rings and dojos and all the rest of it. So, um, and I mean that in the best possible way that I wasn't a thug because the first thing any good um, place like that should teach you is how to talk yourself out of a situation, the escape routes, the things like that. So I thought, well, the people that seem to get paid the most that do the least are those chaps in the black jackets on the door. So I thought I'll, I'll do that for a while. And um, I, I got myself quite a quite a good reputation um, for all the right reasons, and uh, I ended up starting my own company and taking uh, quite a lot of doors in Edinburgh. And then I was asked to try out for a um, security organisation, and uh, so I sold my little door company and and tried out for the security organisation. And fortunately, that's that's when my a career in the security industry to cops. So I used to, uh, I used to be part of protection details and other bits and bobs. And then six years after I started that, I was, uh, I was in a bar in Aberdeen on my off time, uh, next to a quite well oiled rig manager who said, uh, do you know what a roast about it? I said, no, I've got no problem. I, I got no, no idea what a roast about is. And he said, well, look, I'll pay for you to go on a course where you go in a helicopter simulator and they turn you upside down in a swimming pool. And then you can go to an oil rig. Do you fancy it? And I thought, you know what? Contract's out just now. I'm Let's in. give it a go. So <laughs> four weeks later, I, started, I landed on an oil rig, was handed a mop by a crane operator, which I promptly handed back to him and said, I, I don't believe that uh, this is appropriate. Let me tell you a little bit about me. And uh, he looked at me, shook his shook his head, and said, "Somebody like you will never survive out here." Mm -hmm. Which I don't know if he was speaking from the heart or whether it was a stroke of genius. But I grabbed the malt back off him and uh, and yeah, started mopping. I, I did okay, yeah, yeah. So you end up. Um, did you did you start that life thinking I'll just give this a go for a few trips and see how I get on? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, um, but I've always had a uh, part of the reason I went to the security industry, part of the reason that I enjoyed uh, working doors, and uh, I, I've always had a an instinct to protect. I've always been um, very focused on 
a just society for I, I'm I'm the guy that that if somebody falls over, I'll help them up. I'm the one on the on on the back of the underdog saying, "Look, I'll help." So as soon as I got offshore, I started, you know, looking around and thinking, "Well, you've just landed in one of the high a high hazard industry, possibly the highest hazards on earth, and and you've got 120 people on this on this installation, and not only can you help them do it safer, but you can help them do it more efficiently and you can bring your skills from your previous life to this and, and hopefully make a difference. So, uh, so that's what I did. Um, I did, a I I did my time chasing a hook as a roustabout. I did my time up on the floor, um, mopping the decks in the rain, got to start somewhere. Yep. They used to call it. Yep. Free water. Get outside it. Free water. Get free your water. mop. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and I, I think that's fundamentally very important that you do spend time understanding the coal face, understanding yeah. the way operations actually work. And then um, I I had a an unbelievably good rig manager who I will mention, um, a chap that works for Transocean called um, Andy Leslie. And he gave me an opportunity and he opened the door for me and I certainly didn't hesitate and I didn't look back. So that's when you, that was your first sort of foray into like taking all that stuff that's in your head and actually putting it into practice as a, in health and safety offshore, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is quite incredible because you and I, you and I, uh, I was, I was a, a technical guy offshore, electrician on drilling semis. I never, I actually just visited a jack up once. I was all semi submersibles and then, and then moved into health and safety offshore. And then you and I, I'm just looking at the dates actually. I think I'm a I'm a considerable. Although people might think we're brothers, right? You could be forgiven for that right now, right? You've got a very strong look, Stephen Harris. There's something about. <laughs> well, I think I'm considerably broader than you, and not in a very healthy way. But yes, I, I see where you're going with. <laughs> so we have this. Both of us working in the drilling in the drilling sector, getting into health and safety. Um, I have to say. Um, I, mean, I just I was just thinking back we had a little session this morning just saying how this was going to go and uh I was like do you remember those days when you were a, a, a rig safety training coordinator whatever RSTC I guess Transocean called them right um amazing days when you look back it's like it's like just incredible times I look upon it as as a sort of uh a foundation block of who I am today my time doing that and being involved in that it was a an honor to do it very challenging very yeah. challenging, um, but so rewarding, right? I I absolutely adored it. Absolutely adored it. Um, and learned so much from it. And it was, I mean, I, I loved the industry when I was a, a, a roustabout and a roughneck, but I fell in love with it when I was a safety officer. Mm. That's when I, I had a card that allowed me to go anywhere at all on the rig from yeah. OIM down to wherever I wanted to go. And and it's when you put all the bits and pieces together of what everyone does and how all the bits combine to this marvel of engineering who is drilling kilometers into the ground in order to do incredible things like power hospitals back on the beach. Yeah. I mean, it was it was utterly fantastic. And if you ever get bored, it's like Einstein said, you know, if you never really understand something, you just haven't taken the time to try to understand it. Mm -hmm. On an oil rig, it's much the same. Um, there's nothing super complex on an oil rig, although people will tell you that there is. Um, but once you sit down and realize that, and I'm going to get into technical terms here, but the, the socio-technical environment and how it all harmonizes and works together and subsequently in some parts doesn't work. Yep. And, and how all the the influences come in and hit it. You know, you asked me at the beginning of this, well, not the beginning, but, but into it, you know, what does economics teach you? And, and ugh, oil rigs. Let's just say, in answer to the question earlier, oil rigs. Oil rigs. Oil rigs. <laughs> <laughs> so so things, things started going really well for you um, offshore. And I guess there was a point where, like me, you were asked to move onshore. And take I resisted it for resisted as much. Oh, for as long as I possibly could. Um, so I left Transocean and uh, I was picked up by a wonderful rig inspection company called um, Aberdeen Drilling Consultants. And I worked for 
years and years and years with ADC going all around the world from, you know, really interesting places like Libya, who, you know, it was challenging and, and Nigeria and Azerbaijan. And, and oh, I was I was really, really fortunate. Well, it's from the list I read earlier. Um, after that, I was headhunted by uh, by Premier Oil to uh, be the in-country well site HSE lead for the Falkland Islands campaign, which was brilliant. So I got to do things like set up heliports, set up supply bases, bring the rig over, um, and worked with some of the most fantastically nice people. And the Falkland Islanders are just amazing. They are they are brilliant. I met some friends for life down there. Um, so you actually got to spend lots of time in the... I mean, not yeah. many of us are going to be able to do that uh, in our lives, but you actually got to get to the Falklands and get to know people and establish relationships. What on earth was that like? Oh, it was brilliant. I, I've got a... You know, we, we even brought our own accommodation down. Um, but, you know, it was perfectly normal for us to be walking down from our accommodation to the Victory Bar, the aptly named, and uh, for their penguin to be walking down the street beside you. <laughs> And there'd be pickled penguins eggs on the bars when you went down there. And I remember they were fiercely, fiercely British. And I remember I first got down there. Um, part of the reason that I was going down early was hearts and minds. And it was relatively easier for me because I had a Scottish accent than a than a clipped English accent. And it's just perception. It's just the, it, it's partly easier for me to ingratiate myself, especially with others. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I said that, you know, how are, and they talked to me at the Victory Bar, um, asked my opinion on Scottish independence and are you one of us or are you one of them? And, and I ended up having to say to him, look, this is not a conversation I'm going to have with you. I just want to have a beer and say hi. And he's like, oh, all right. you know, but it, it was, it, it, they're just so fiercely British. It was, it was. Well, they'd be, they'd be all over you today with the recent announcements about, um, about Nicola, about Nicola resigning and all of that. Yeah. First Minister, yeah. we've got a bit of change ahead of us in Scotland. Um, we do. So we do. all the way through, I'm interested through your childhood, through sport, through school, university, running your own company on the doors. There's leadership threads running through all of this, right? And yeah. I guess I guess you're studying leadership, not just studying the leadership that you're seeing around you and that you're actually you're actually giving off yourself, but you're reading about it, you're studying, you're investing time understanding leadership. Leaders for anyone that knows you, you'll know that leadership uh, is a is a subject you are fascinated with, right? Absolutely. What 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 is this? And lots of people say, "Well, oh, I'm uh, you know I, I, I'm kind of into leadership." But if if you want to know about being into leadership, speak to Steve Harris, right? So what what got you interested in the sort of the art, the science, and all of the breakdown elements of leadership? When did you start to really think about this as a topic? As a, as a topic, you can trace it straight back to my childhood, and I've reflected on this this question. Uh, for quite a while now when i was growing up my father who i'll mention a couple of times because he was a he was a big influence and i was fortunate with that he said that you you basically are who you hang with so your 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 immediate friends and those that you choose to spend your time with are a reflection of you and you need to be very careful with that but you also need to learn to to grow with them and, and take those lessons from them and I thought about that for a while. And I thought, well, in that case, I want to hang with the best people possible. So how can I how can I access people like Ranulph Fiennes? How can I access people like Gavin Hastings? How can I access um, a golf commander, General Sir Peter de la Villiers or Norman Schwarzkopf? How can I access these people? And, and I did it through autobiographies. And uh, oh. so I was an avid reader because if you are who you hang with, I wanted to hang with the best possible people and read all about them. So I read everyone from uh, David Coulthart down to I don't know who. Um, and the common thread, and, and, and the funny thing is, the perception of someone's life and the reality of someone's life are sometimes two very different things. It's, you know, you take it back to the oil rigs again. The, the work is prescribed and work is done. 
are sometimes two completely different things. The managers back in on shore will say, oh, my people follow the management system exactly. And the, the people offshore will be, well, the management system's a nice guide. Yes, but, okay. guidance you know, documents. Yeah. We know how to get stuff done yeah. better. You know, and, and that tends to be the same when people write books in that the, their perception of their reality and their actual reality are two separate things. So that was always in the back of my mind. But it seemed to be everybody that I read about classed themselves uh, in some way or other as a leader and would talk about leadership. Um, and it was quite interesting because uh, it was interesting for me and a learning for me as well because I'd, I'd read about these incredible people and then I'd try and adopt what they were talking about. But I wouldn't try and um, fit it to my personality and my natural behaviors and be authentic and be comfortable with it so I could grow, I would genuinely try to be those people. Uh -huh. So I would, I'd read a book by an incredible military commander, an incredibly uh, successful commercial leader, and I'd think, right, okay, Richard Branson, today I'm Richard Branson. I'm going to do yes. everything he does and everything's going to fall into place. And of course it doesn't because our journey through life is contextually relevant. Not only is it relevant to what's around us, but it's relevant to what's inside us. So reading about their journey, it took me a while to realize that that nudges and feeds into me. And I have to pick the value out for me. And I also have to disregard what's not valuable in order to grow into a comfortable place in terms of leadership, mentoring, coaching, that type of thing. And it, it was it was an interesting uh it was, it was an interesting journey. So yeah, it started back in my childhood when I was a, just an avid reader. Here's a question for you. And it's a loaded question because uh, what I'm about to say next will probably interest some people if they don't know. Um, leaders, nature or nurture? Both. So you can, um, I know it's a poor, it's Andy's a poor off. answer. I know, but... no, Andy's off. Um, yeah, 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 your fault. <laughs> so um, a natural leader, yes, you, you get natural leaders. Uh, your natural leaders, you'll tend to find at your uh, Sunday league uh, football matches, they'll be in charge of the team. Natural leaders will tend to be the ones that organize the groups down at the pub. Natural leaders are great. They're fantastic. But natural reader, leaders are only on stage. Beyond that, Leadership needs to be taken to a different angle and elevated so that it becomes consistent and reliable and can return on major high hazard, high reliability projects. You would not necessarily have the captain of your Sunday league football team as the CEO of your organization. Two completely different things. So are there natural leaders? Yes, there are. But if those natural leaders want to go to any real meaningful level of leadership, then they need to be nurtured to take them onto that that extra and, level. And for the leaders that have changed the world and that are changing the world and that are leading really well, maybe not changing the world, but leading really, really well, do you think there's an element that you're that that you are born with and that some people don't have? Um it's a difficult question, but my feeling is no. Right. Um my feeling is that um you're very much a product of your circumstance, but if you have a look back at the leaders of the past that you you really love, so say for example we take Nelson Mandela, who's who's you know he's on everyone's lips whenever we talk yeah. about leadership, and he will be forever thanked by a grateful nation and a grateful world, and he was, you know, rejoiced with the Nobel Peace Prize. What Nelson did really well was enacted values that resonated with his population. That was it. He yep. didn't jump over the trenches and charge machine guns. He didn't do, he consistently demonstrated the behaviors in a very, very defined value system that resonated with the population. And then he stood on the shoulders of giants and he was, he was, uh, he, he was brought up. But I, I think that is, that is critically important. I, I speak to an awful lot of people and, and ask about their why. And I, I think this is a, uh, we're starting to get into, when you're starting to talk about asking about whys, we're starting to get into cliched broad brush statements, which are 
can be dangerous and detrimental. But when when we ask somebody about their why, and they turn around and say, "That's a great question, actually." What what a okay. There's your fundamental building block that we're gonna we're we're gonna go on before we get to any kind of uh, transformational to transactional style with directive and affiliative pieces. We we just need to understand the why, and then we can put that onto a framework and then we can start to get succession and development. Yeah, you opened the door there. I just flew I through did. it. I did. I'm super sorry. Now, yeah. the reason I kind of teed that up, that nature and nurture no. question is there are many people who are into business topics. There are many people who are interested in particular subject matters or subject matter specialists. Not everybody takes their subject matter specialism or, or topic interest and writes a book about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and ladies and gentlemen, so for those you don't know, beginning of March, beginning of beginning March, first of March, first of March, beginning yeah. of March, Stephen Harris becomes one of those published authors. The Little Book of Leadership is—is is it done? I guess it is now, right? It's done. It's uh, it's 171 pages, and it's uh, it contains metaphors and academic theory and anecdotes and it. It talks about the subject in a in an in an engaging narrative that's meant to bring it alive. Um, an awful lot of the inspiration for the way that I wrote it was taken from uh, the brilliant people that do TED talks, Eric, of which you were one. And and what it does is it it doesn't teach leadership. It teaches you how to teach yourself leadership because it's a personal journey, and I'm not there with you, so. What I want to do is I want to arm the reader with the tools and the examples, and I want to tell the reader about how things have affected me in my journey, and then they can they can go on their own journey or, or grade where they are on that journey or pick it up and say, that's going to be a new toy for my dog and throw it in the floor. What now, I, many, many people that write books profess to be the sort of all seeing eye and, you know, my word is my word is king. But you've written a little you've written. Can you read out? I, f I find this fascinating. Can you read that little excerpt out about what you want the reader to take away from this? I find this brilliant. Yeah, so I'd, I've I've I put this on the back of the book, and I was speaking to Eric earlier on today, and uh, and he was he was, you know, asking me about the book and asking me about if my way was the right way or the wrong way, and I was saying, well, there is no right way or wrong way. As I said earlier, everything's contextually relevant. So I actually put this on the back of the book when I sent it to the printers two or three weeks ago. Um, and it goes, finally, please remember that this book is made from my collective experiences, not yours. We're all individuals and unique. After all, that's what makes life great. And as Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. With that in mind, drink in every word, but do not necessarily accept everything that I have said or written. Above all else, you must be authentic and own your own perspective. So that's all I'm trying to do with this book is just say, here's my perspective. Here's where it comes from. Here's how to build one over to you. That's the idea. I'm not preaching. I'm not teaching. I'm coaching. And you've done something else quite special because I'm going to tee this up for you. Although I know the answer, <laughs> right? I'm going to, because I'm sure you've written this book to, to, to make a couple of million in sales, right? Hundred percent, Eric. It was all commercially driven. But, the exact uh, opposite you've chosen to do with the proceeds from this book, right? Yeah. So all all the proceeds will be going to Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, nothing will be coming back to my pocket. Um, I think I, if I was to write a novel or if I was to write, you know, something like that, then yeah, great. But. I'm writing about something that is that is really truly important to me, and it kind of leadership sits on a pedestal with me. It's it's a huge passion of mine in life, and I thought, what better way to commemorate writing a book and publishing my first book, which I still, you know, beggars belief that I just said that, than uh, than give the proceeds to Macmillan Cancer Support and help those heroes and heroines that do a job that um, I don't have the strength to do. I uh, I look at what they do, especially when they're giving end of life care, and think, 
you are infinitely stronger than I am. That would crush me. How on earth do you do that day in, day out? So, uh, so yeah, hopefully we can, we can, you know, kind of two birds with one stone. We can, we can add a little bit of value into the industry uh, if the industry wants it, but we can also help those people out. And where are people going to be able to buy this book? Is it usual? Is it like Amazon and stuff like that? Or it, yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm Amazon self-publishing. Um, so that'll be uh, the first of March. I'll I'll make a splash on social media. Yeah, um, do that. I will be. Uh, I will. I will be punting it. You know, not not to a. Oh God, here's Steve. Here's Steve again. But yeah, I'll be. I'll be. I'll be talking about it for a while. Every time we see you, you're going to have a little book to the side of your head with that yeah, yeah. cover on it with a little purple and, ship. I love it. And did I mention? <laughs> you know? Did I mention? Yeah. Did I mention? Yes. Yes. A few times. But okay, I'll buy another copy because it's for a good cause. Awesome. No, I'm looking forward to that. That's absolutely fabulous. So a big time, a big time of exciting change for you. The book launch, also a bit of a, a career change for. So as it, as it stands right now, your LinkedIn headline says preparing for an an announcement whilst helping a select group of clients unlock workforce potential. Are we able to talk about it? We haven't talked about it openly. But, I know. Um, yeah. If we just shove you a little bit. Yeah. I, okay. I, yeah. An exclusive. Um, exclusive. Um, on the 1st of March, I'll also be uh, launching my own organization, uh, oh. which I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, it's going to be called Integrity HSE because it is going to be driven by values and by meaningful contribution. It is not going to be a transactional organization that is driven by money. Um, and I have a philosophy and a business plan behind that. And I believe that other organizations, especially within my within my discipline, as much respect that I have for them are, uh, some of them are a little bit cart leading the horse. So I'm, right. I'm going to concentrate on customer centric delivery, on, on solving problems, not trying to fit cookie cutters and, uh, and hopefully teach people about risk at the same time, like we said, so they get it. So they're in there. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have a couple of different parts to it. We're going to be a, an HSE consultancy, but I'm very excited about, uh, we're, we're also going to be a training provider. So we're going to, um, do a couple of courses for the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health for IOSH. Uh, we're going to do a couple of courses for the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management. And uh, we're, we're also going to be putting our toe in the water on leadership courses as well. But there'll be a, there'll be short, sharp, punchy leadership courses. They won't be um, come along to this conference center and let's do role play all, all day. They'll, they'll be meaningful success criteria. They'll be, I, I think, I, I think. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. So you heard it here first. Integrity HSE. Integrity HSE. That's right. Yeah. It's coming. It's coming. Absolutely fantastic. Book launch, a new company. And and if anybody was looking at social media and anyone that might be connected to Steve in any way, you might have noticed. I've got a I've got a sort of a, a deeper sort of connection into this is that my wife actually works with your partner. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I get to see and she ran in the other day and she went, look at this. And it was, he popped the question. So you you finally decided, how long have you and Emily been together? Uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years, so, and you're getting married. And we're getting married. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, probably autumn 2024, something like that. And uh, genuinely could not be happier. Uh, she's, uh, she's an incredible lady. And... Um, you know, on a professional front, I'm very fortunate in that she works in the energy sector. So yep. she has an understanding of the industry and an understanding of what I do. Um, and she is able to try and gel that with what understanding she has of me to, to put up with me when I when I get ridiculously, you know, focused on projects and all the rest of it. She's uh She's great. She's super. So we're we're very very happy. But and we are thrilled for you. There's some congratulations coming in. Thanks from uh, David and Andrew. Some lovely congratulations coming in for that. You have got a lot going on. I do. I do. I didn't think a book and a company was enough. So I thought, let's get married all at the same time. 
So <laughs> you'll be you you'll be neck deep in this, and I know that we've. I hope he's still with us. Brett uh, Brett Townsley's on the line. Um, how do you how do you how do you keep yourself sane with all of this stuff to do? What how do you decompress? What's your what's your kind of like downtime like? Uh, my downtime, I'm I um. Well, it's quite funny actually because. An awful lot of the people that will have logged on today and, and certainly an awful lot of my network will look at me thinking, wow, look, he's so front facing and he's he's out there all the time and he must really enjoy it. I'm I'm actually a, an introvert by nature, uh, which which works really well for me um, in the security industry. And it worked well for me uh, beginning of the oil industry. And then then I understood that I really needed to to open up to the world. So. Something like this is fantastic for me because it, um, it very much it's just one on one, me and you. Um, yep. You know, it's brilliant. Everyone else is here, and I hope you're having a ball. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just seeing this as a one to one fireside chat, me and her. And it's the same with conferences as well. When I'm on stage, it's fantastic. I can, I, I, I switch myself off, and I can, I can speak to the room, and, and the more the merrier. You know, hundreds and thousands and all the rest of it. I love it. But when I'm in a busy room, I find it quite exhausting, and that's uh, that's one of the uh, one of the traits of being a being an introvert. And I've, I've trained myself up over the years to actually really enjoy mixing and, and networking, because in the early days I thought, oh gee whiz, I'm going to have to meet some new people, and these days I'm sitting here thinking, everyone's got a story. I can't wait to hear it. And I wonder if we can work together. I wonder if this is the person that's going to unlock my potential and is going to help Integrity HSE as much as I can help them. So it's a, it's a completely different thing these days. But the point of me telling that story was, first of all, so that the introverts in the, in, in the crowd can sit there and say, oh, I'm one of them. I understand. OK, so it gets easier. Fair enough. Um, but also, it's very dependent upon how I fill my day, how I, how I relax. So in true introverted style, I live rurally um, mm -hmm. and I've got a dog that I spend yep. an awful lot of time with um, mm -hmm. and uh, the Six Nations is on just now. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I love rugby. I love the outdoors. Um, and it's a joy to be a Scotland rugby fan right now. And we don't say that very often, but it is a joy. We are riding high. I, I actually looked at the IRB world rankings earlier today and we are above England, which is amazing. And okay. the vast majority of my family is English, so I, I have a I have a soft spot for, for English rugby. Um but we're only two spots away from the all blacks, which I find just yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Well well um, you know that we run a little show on a Thursday morning called the Big Live Breakfast Burrito, right? So this is this is I can I can die happily in life, right? So last uh, last week's show, I was looking at uh, the attendance and who watched the show. Pierre Schumann watched the show. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's right. it. We've reached, we've reached the pinnacle. Um, Steve, Steve, a lot's going on, lots of good stuff. We've actually got some lovely questions that have come in from our, our viewers today. I'm going to go back to, um, the, <laughs> this is quite, a, I'm sure it's, a, yeah, it's got a smiley face. Um, from uh, Carolyn Smith, can you tell us about a time you failed to make the rest of us feel better? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take it in a different direction here, one one that you might not be expecting. Um, so just over four years ago, as uh, somebody um, on an oil rig that I was looking after when I was back on the beach committed suicide and jumped off the oil rig. Um, I was uh, I was their immediate line manager. We were phenomenally good friends. We were phenomenally good colleagues. And uh, it was all down to a situation that was away from the rig. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were spoken to afterwards by the wonderful Car Carolyn Taylor, who is an incredible lady who did an awful lot of work for mental health. And she reassured us and everyone on the rig that there was absolutely no way to no way to tell that it was going to happen and that we didn't hold any blame. We didn't hold any anything at all. He was a very well liked member of the crew. And uh, and yeah, so as much as I 
I'm not responsible, arguably accountable because I was his line manager, but it does, I do think about it quite often so yeah. thinking, is there something I could have seen? Is there something I could have said? Is there a, a program that I could have put in place where the door was open for him to talk? Now, he left a, a suicide note for me and he left one for his wife. And in my suicide note, he said, uh, I only wish I knew how to talk. So in terms of where where I have, uh, where I potentially failed in the past, do I think I've failed because of that? Uh, no, not, not, not massively. Am I using Carolyn's question as a vehicle to talk about this? Because I think it's important. Yes, I think I probably am. But um, that is why I'm very passionate about uh, mental health, about putting the, the correct systems in place. And it's sometimes why when somebody comes to me and says, you know what, Steve, we've got mental health first aiders in our organization. I put my head in my hands and say, that's like saying I've got first aiders in the building because people keep on injuring themselves. Yep. Why do people injure themselves? What, how can we get ahead of it so that we don't need mental health first aiders? So, um, and that, that, that takes, that's, you know, if I hear one more person say, we've got a mental health initiative, I don't want an initiative. I want I want a meaningful change in your organisation. Brett Tesley's so, yeah. feet, are, feet are curling because uh, uh, he's <laughs> roaring, roaring in agreement. Um, thank you, Carolyn. That was a, a great question. The the wonderful Joe Hughes, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, and a clever chap, has asked this question, which is which we could do another hour on, right? Yeah. Um, interesting conversation. Thanks for sharing, James. I'd like to hear if Steve has any thoughts on the dark side of leadership, oh. Jim Jones. <laughs> Darth Vader, <laughs> etc. Drink the Kool Aid, etc., etc. Any thoughts on uh, how how le effective leaders have maybe led us into trouble? Oh, it, yeah. I mean, there's there's numerous examples of that when when sometimes confidence is mistaken for competence. But I would say when we come down to the dark side of leadership, um, there was an incredible man called Brigadier Richard Holmes, and unfortunately, he's passed away. But Brigadier Holmes was the reason that we have a vast amount of understanding about certain aspects of leadership. And he talks about the 10 leadership diseases. Now, sometimes when, when something is going wrong, a leader, especially uh, uh, perhaps somebody that's uh, uh, not quite used to the position will tend to look out at blame and say, where are things going wrong? I can fix it. And what Brigadier Holmes says is before you start looking outward, you need to look inward and make sure that the issue isn't actually with yourself. Yeah. And he gives these 10 diseases. And I think it is absolutely critical for every leader to be able to recognize the 10 diseases. And, and from that type of self-awareness, it's easier for them to keep themselves on the right road and develop properly. But um you you can speak to the vast majority of of leaders and say, "Tell me about your competence. Tell me about when it developed." And they'll give you a, an idea of a management course that they went on ten years ago. And you say, "Well, no, leadership and management are completely different." And, oh, but Steve, you can't say that because you know I've been leading for ten years. Well, perhaps you've been leading wrong for ten years. So let's let's revisit and come back. Maybe it's okay to accept that. Yeah, Maybe it's yeah. okay to accept that, you know, because you do, it's not it's not it's not a dent on your personality or anything. Just accept it and and learn and move on. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. But the dark side of leadership, great question. Brigadier Holmes, 10 Diseases of Leadership. You'll find it at the Center for Army Leadership, which is an online resource uh, that Sandhurst publishes that everyone has access to. Holy moly. Um, a lovely question just to end on. One of the toughest what's the toughest intervention you've ever made, please? Hmm. I know mine. Do you want me to share mine? You can have a think Go about on. it. I got Go a on. phone call. I was the safety officer uh, on a drilling rig, and I got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning when I was off shift to my cabin, and it just said, get to the cellar deck. And the phone went down, and I put on my coveralls and put on my boots and went down to the cellar deck. There was the company, all the company reps, day and night, the night and day pusher, the OIM, the barge master, all standing around the uh, uh, moon pool. We've got guys overboard. The waves are smashing through the moon pool. The standby vessel is way off standby distance. 
we are way beyond man riding limits and we've got people trying to get goosenecks being thrown around in the moon pools with everyone watching here and I turned up and said good evening gents good morning what's going on here you just get back to your bed this is nothing to do with you we've got this under control and I said so we're breaking we're, we're not just we're not just sort of like grazing a couple of our policies here we're fundamentally it's a thou shalt not put a man overboard in a man riding if the waves are over two meters high and they're smashing through it. They're, 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 you're all soaked because it's we're we're being thrown around. The standby vessels miles away. You can't even see it. If any of those guys go in the water, they're going to die. If they don't die with all the kit moving about in here, um, I'm the OIM. I'm in control here. There's nothing to do with you. Took me to one side and said, um, "You're going to get fired over this Doyle if you don't." And I said, "Fine. I'm going up to the radio room. What are you going to do there? I'm going to phone Houston. I'm going to report it. You're barred from the radio room. You're not allowed. I've told the radio operator to shut the doors and lock them. You're not allowed in. That was the oh, toughest man. intervention. That that was blood, sweat and tears for about five hours and resulted in lots and lots of heavy drama. And it was very tense. What about yeah. yourself? Well, there's a couple of... Uh... On a similar one night, I was uh, I was working for an operator and we took on a rig and I went out to see the rig and... Uh, the 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 guys um were were fantastic they were phenomenal um the management on the rig was not and uh i went back to the beach uh spoke to the uh wells manager and said uh, he said what do you think we should do and i said shut it down not expecting him to do it and he turned around and said i'll back you but on your head be it i said okay shut it down so it shut it down and then i spent the next probably two years rebuilding a relationship with the people on that rig. Yeah. Um, but, you know, recently I, I see, I see such fantastic examples. So um, I mentioned Aberdeen drilling consultants earlier on. I, I had a phenomenally good time with them. Um, recently I I've been working and I'm still working with Moji spec who, who I think are just a cut above everyone else. I think they're fantastic. That's just my opinion, but I think they're fantastic. Um, and they, their operations manager is a chap, Watson, and Marks. Um, Marks called me a couple of times saying, "Look, one of my inspectors has seen this, and I've shut down the job. It's just to let you know this could cause massive waves, you know, with yeah. a client with this and with that." And because I saw those great examples earlier in my career, I've always turned around and said, "Mark, you know what? We, there's a moral, there's a legal, and there's an economic decision behind everything that we do, mm -hmm. and you are ticking all the boxes. Let's shut it down." the the passion and the caring that he has about his, his inspectors is something to marvel but um it's just the ease when you're in the right organization with the right structure that you're able to sit there and say one of my people are not happy i'm shutting it down and then the whole organization turns around and says i'm backing my people yeah that that is that's something special that's, that's and on that bombshell, we've covered we've covered the your history in in turbo speed. We've covered the new book on March the first, the little book of leadership. It's got a yep. beautiful graphic on it, a little uh, series of little uh, like uh, paper boats, and one of them's purple at the front. I love that. That's, that's a nod to my dad when he was at sea. Ah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So we know we we know that now. Uh, we've covered your uh, impending marriage. Congratulations on that. The new company, March the first, Integrity HSE. Um, all wonderful. You know, you you said um, you are who you hang with, and I've been blessed and honoured today to have to be able to hang with you today, which has been brilliant. Thank you so much to everyone that joined us and for all your lovely questions and comments. This is that is brilliant. This has been Cruxcast 68 with Stephen Harris. I don't think it's the last one with you, sir, if that's okay. We'll revisit this. Give it six Thank months. You. See how we get on. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today uh, on Cruxcast. We shall see you later. Bye-bye.